everybody, welcome back to my channel. Sorry I look such a mess, I'm on broadcast later today and I usually like to leave it until right the last second where I do my makeup and get ready, so you get this. On social media at the moment there has been a lot of discussion about, surprise surprise, casters, casting. It always comes around every now and then, it's kind of an inevitability at this point. But I thought that it could be an opportunity to make what I think might be quite a useful video explaining some of the technicalities of casting just to give people a bit more context as to what actually goes into it. There are screaming children outside, this is great. Personally I'm of the opinion that uh, you're welcome to like or not like anyone's casting for whatever reason you want. After all, it is you who gets to form your own opinions about things and if you don't like someone, you don't like someone. However, some of the criticism that gets shared online is very clearly misguided, at least to people who actually are in casting, for example, and they know what goes into it. They can look at some criticism and just be like, this person has no idea what, what goes into casting. But what usually ends up happening is a complete war <laughs> between, I don't know, Reddit and Twitter, and I don't know, whoever else. Um, so I just thought this could be a useful tool because at the end of the day, there isn't really any reason why people who don't do casting would know about any of the technicalities of it. So this might be a good opportunity. So I wrote this over breakfast this morning. It looks a bit like a university lecture. Look at all these graphs and shit. Uh, this isn't everything to do with casting. This is just some of the big points that I thought might help. All right, these fucking kids, dude. Shut the fuck up. God damn. Okay. So yeah, this is absolutely not everything to do with casting. This is just some major things. So let's start. I wanted to start by just focusing on the two primary roles within casting. Those are color casting and play by play. Now, a lot of people have a vague idea as to what these two roles do, but there's actually a lot more depth to it. So a color caster, most people know that that is the person who does the analytical breakdown. That is kind of the live real time analyst. However, color casters are also responsible for things like energy management, which I'll explain later on. Uh, they're usually the humor foil, which means that when the play-by-play -play is making jokes, the color caster is usually the person who will shut that down. Uh, a real notable exception in tier one, and especially here in Siege, is Kix Nintero, where you usually see Nintero playing the foil, despite the fact that he's the play-by-play. -play. So it's not a steadfast rule by any means. Color casters are usually uh, also responsible for mostly maintaining the pace of the broadcast. Play-by-play -play is the person who most people will know is responsible for the narration of the action that is happening. They're also mostly responsible for storytelling, hype building, and opening and closing a cast plus transitioning the chapters of a cast so when you have to move on to the next part of the story that you're telling the next point of the game the next point of the cast it's usually the play-by-play -play who is in charge of doing that most casting duos will have distinct roles between the two casters. Siege is a bit more hybrid than other games that you will see, and there are a number of reasons for that, and I will kind of touch on that later. Uh, but here in Siege, I would say if you want an example of a hybrid casting duo, our closest thing in tier one is probably Blue and Stokes. If you listen to their cast, both of them like to take the role of play-by-play -play and color caster at various points, and I would say that it's a lot more of a 50-50 split between those two than what you see with other casters in our scene. So the important things to understand about a cast first and foremost is what is the objective of a cast? I've written down three main objectives of a cast but they it's not exhaustive. So these aren't in a specific order but the first one I've written down is to make exciting. You need good hype and if you don't have good hype it's going to be pretty freaking dull but at the same time you can't over hype everything and most people here in siege will remember the era of bloodbath and the biggest complaint about him was always that he tried to make everything exciting you have to strike that balance one way or the other to any extreme is gonna sound very uncomfortable. Ensuring that the hype is done in the right moment also helps to drive interest and engagement in the game uh, and the, tell the holistic story of what is going on. Number two reason for a cast is to inform. And you need the analysis of a round, but analysis is oftentimes limited by things like time constraints, as well as uh, the end, the action that's happening. So, you know, I could start analyzing something and if some action starts happening 10 seconds later, my analysis is gonna be cut short by that. 
part of making a cast informative, it's really important to only focus on one point at a time. This is something that amateur casters often have to learn a lot. I see it a lot in amateur casting. I did it when I was an amateur caster. And that is ensuring that when you are focusing on your analysis, you are going one point at a time. You're not trying to fit everything in. Chances are you've seen a number of things that you could have spoken about, but there are a lot of reasons why you would choose what it is you're going to choose to talk about. And again, that's something I'll touch on later. Now, I've described the analysis of cast in the context of a bell curve, which is this. It's just a normal distribution graph. The bell curve represents the skill level or understanding of the audience who is watching the cast. On the upper half of the bell curve, you have people who are more likely to already understand what you're telling them and to have noticed more things than you are speaking about. On the lower half of the bell, uh, bell curve, you have people who aren't more likely to have already understood them or won't have necessarily uh, noticed those things. Now, oftentimes a cast is going to hover around the middle of that bell curve, but there are certain instances where you would expect a cast to go more one way or the other. And that is down to the discretion of the casters. However, it is somewhat formulaic. There are going to be different points at which you want to focus on different populations within that bell curve at different times. So the examples I've written down is qualifiers, for example, might be more advanced. Qualifiers are quite a niche part of a broadcast. They're quite a niche part of being involved in an esports or even sports scene. So you're more likely to want to uh, relate to those or that audience who know a bit more about the game. However, the SI finals are probably going to be quite broad because that's where we have the highest viewership. You want to be bringing in new viewers as well as appealing to the ones who already know a lot because they're huge fans of the scene already. So that should be quite a broad cast. Then when you have things like drops, which is something that we've had recently, and anything that could bring in new audiences, that's when you want to be giving a bit more attention attention to those lower level players and the newer audience who come in and maybe don't know a ton about Siege. So examples of appealing to the lower level, uh, you might hear certain callouts be more generalized or really based around the compass callouts. You might hear utility, which to you is super obvious and doesn't need explaining, get explained in a bit more depth and the fundamentals of the game because we're expecting audiences to be coming in that need that. And part of that will also be down to uh, the people who look at the analytics of channels and things like that and actually uh, analyze who is watching the game or the scene at any one time will tell us what kind of audiences to expect um, and we will act accordingly. The third objective for a cast is to entertain. And most casters will argue that this is actually the most important objective. A boring but knowledgeable cast is going to be infinitely worse to listen to than an interesting but general cast. And the reason that a lot of people argue against that is because they have not been super exposed to very boring, albeit knowledgeable casts. This is also why it's not just as simple as bring in pro players to, to cast. In Siege especially, we are, uh, <laughs> this is a scene where a lot of pros don't even want to be on camera. Being on camera to cast requires a serious amount of on-camera skill, charisma, and casting, I would argue, is, is even more performative than being on an analyst desk, for example. You are playing a character. It is, to an extent, acting. So... You can't just expect someone to be good at those things just because they've been good at the game. Now, in every scene, you're going to have ex-pros who you find on uh, an analyst desk or they find casting. Our golden example is Kickstarter. In other scenes, you have other ex-pros and things like that. But you can't just assume that all ex-pros are going to be like that. It is a vast minority. What you will gain by an ex-pro knowing things to a slightly higher level does not make up for what they might lack in all of the other parts. So you really have to have a good balance. It's not as simple as just bringing in ex-pros. They have to be first and foremost good on-camera talent. Now, because entertaining is arguably the most important part of a cast, this is why on-camera relationships and synergy is so important, which brings me on to my next section, and that is synergy. <laughs> I've also, I don't know if you can see this, I've written it as the Kicks and Intero effect. The reason being is not because Kicks and Intero are the only casters ever to have good synergy, but in Siege, we are quite top heavy in the sense that they are the only long-standing Siege duo who are still casting the game. Kicks and Intero have been casting together for 
for three and a half years. No other Siege duo who is currently casting at tier one here has been casting together that long. You could argue, I suppose, that Blue and Stokes have been casting together for a long time, but for most of that, it's just been four events. Um, or rather, even in USN, they were still casting with Veli as well. So they weren't just an independent duo that existed on its own. Everything that has to be achieved in a cast can only be done well if you have a solid understanding of what your caster is going to do or what your co-caster is going to do in the future. This is why developing duos is really difficult to do online because a lot of those things and those building the understanding of what to expect your co-caster to do and how they talk, how they behave has to be done in real life. What a lot of people won't know is when you cast together in real life, it's very physical. That doesn't mean you're climbing on top of each other, but what it does mean is people use a lot of hand signals, for example. Uh, I remember when one of the first hand signals I ever learned in casting back when I was casting Overwatch uh, was if you want your co-caster to wrap up their point, you go like this. And I remember the first time someone did that to me, I thought they were being really rude. And then I realized that I was, I was quite standard. <laughs> It's also why a lot of issues that you may take in a certain cast can't be put down to the individual skill or lack thereof of a caster because so much of it is based around the synergy with your duo. If you can't correctly predict what your duo is gonna do or if they can't correctly predict what you are going to do, a lot of the technicals of the cast are actually going to fall through. So, so much of it comes down to that synergization. It's why last year when there was the caster rotation in EUL, this was a really big point of conversation. And I'd imagine many people probably didn't really get why it was so important, but it is truly, truly important because so much of everything that's done in the cast is encompassed by that synergy with your duo. Even really simple things like hype are super hard to execute without that sufficient synergy between the, the the two casters because you have to have really solid energy management which brings me on to my next point energy versus energy management these are two distinctly different things in a cast and it's worth knowing what they are and what they represent within a cast so Energy is just what level you're talking at and why. Energy directly should relate to the action that is happening on the screen, and it should also relate to the viewer's emotions. When viewers don't like it, if casters get too hype or not hype enough, it's because there is a disparity between the emotion the viewer is feeling when watching the cast and the emotion the caster is conveying when casting the cast. Those two things have to be as in sync as possible for energy to be done really well. And usually that is the role of the play-by-play -play because the play-by-play -play is calling a lot of the action. It is their job to decide how much energy to convey. In fact, one of the hardest things for sort of early play-by-play -play casters to get right is being able to judge when a round isn't exciting enough to put in all of the energy. If every single round end you're doing ends at super high energy, what you're doing is diluting the meaning of the rounds that really deserve the high energy. And that's something that's really hard to learn for people who are quite new. So it does require a lot of skill. Now, energy management is setting up for a future energy level. And this is a role of a color caster. And this is something I worked really hard on back when I was casting Overwatch because I sucked at it in the early days. What it requires is really good prediction and situational awareness. It's your job essentially to try and foresee what is going to happen, but also how your co-caster is going to react to something so that you can sufficiently set up that energy. It's really important to have a solid buildup and a really good come down. So I've drawn these two graphs graphs as an example. So the top graph represents bad energy management and the bottom graph represents good energy management. And the reason is because if you have uh, the color caster talking down here and the play by play is going up to here, you don't want a really stark jump between those two things because what ends up happening is it sounds disjointed, it sounds wrong, it sounds like you're not on the same page. What the color caster has to do is have that gradual buildup that is directly related to what is happening on screen and what they expect the play by play to do and then also bring it back down. And a lot that's involved in the bringing back down of the energy is the color caster won't immediately dive into analysis. What you'll often hear is the color caster will uh, almost add some story flavor into the come down from a big hype 
um, maybe just emphasizing the point of what's happened because that's the best way that you can naturally transition. And then you can move into the analysis which should be at a much lower energy level. If you were to just jump between the two, it would sound really wrong. Similarly, when you're leading up to a high energy level, what you'll oftentimes hear is a color caster do the first couple of lines of play by play because that helps lead in and then you immediately hand off to your color uh, your play by play caster who is ready to pick up it's also another example of when synergy is really important because there are certain situations where it is better for the color caster to immediately drop off and let the play by play caster pick up within milliseconds usually that's in a situation that's more predictable that's going to happen so when it's not necessarily sudden action where you need that more gradual uh, push up because the color caster may have already been talking and you don't want to immediately drop off but if it's kind of been telegraphed for a while in the round the color caster should be able to just drop off and the play-by-play -play caster pick up immediately. But this is way easier to do in person because you can signal to your play-by-play -play caster when that's going to happen. That is a, such a strong example of when synergy is really important and how, something that's really hard to achieve online, regardless of how well synergized you are, just because of the nature of the expectation. The next thing I wanted to move on to is pacing and particularly why it's really difficult to nail in Rainbow Six Siege. So you can pretty much put games into two categories and these are categories that I have come up with um, and thought about myself, but that is one, formulaic workflow, and two, spontaneous independent action. Now that might sound like utter bullshit, but like, let's have a look at what they are. Number one, formulaic workflow. This is something that you're more likely to see in MOBAs and hero shooters, for example, Overwatch. What these require in order to actually achieve the objective of the game is a coordinated use of utility to achieve an objective. The action typically happens as a group and it's easier to predict when action is going to occur because multiple people need to be ready and in a certain place in order to do it. Now, what this means is the pacing of the round and the pacing of the cast is going to be predicted by the waves of action that are happening. For example, if utility is ready, uh, if uh, teams are all back from spawn at the right time, you know that action is not going to happen if those things have not been checked off. So it's a lot easier for a color caster to predict how much time they have to talk about the analysis and for a play by play caster to know when they are expected to pick up. The second category um which was spontaneous independent action is what you see in things like csgo and cod this is when plays are made more by individuals and they mostly rely on individual positioning and in a lot of cases gun skill and they don't require group play in waves um, now, what this means for the pacing of the round is, or the cast, sorry, is that the pacing is predicted by major plays that happen, and in the case of something like CSGO, round ends. This is actually why you have little color casting in Call of Duty, because you base everything around the major plays, but the major plays can be happening seconds between each other, so you don't get a lot of downtime to actually be able to color cast, unless you're casting S&D, which is a bit different because it's round based, which goes back around to what I was saying about CSGO, where you color cast at the end of the rounds mostly in csgo for example you have things like economy and positioning which are the real meat of the strategy so you can talk about the positioning uh and stuff like that in the color cast between like within the rounds but you oftentimes color cast between rounds because that's when the downtime is mostly there and that's when you have enough time between those big individual plays um and you're not looking out for things like group plays to know when to to color cast and know when to play by play the thing with Siege is it belongs to both of these categories. Siege requires coordinated utility and individual plays, and it's in short three minute rounds, which means it is so much harder to predict when the correct time to play by play and the correct time to color cast is. The only thing that's ever really guaranteed is the fact that the prep phase is usually used to talk about the last round, and there will almost guaranteed be uh, play by play at the end of any one round. But the thing this means for Siege is there's not really a formula for when to set the pacing. It makes it quite 
spontaneous at times. It's also really limited by the observer tools that we have in Rainbow Six because you can't always see where everyone else is on the map. So you don't have a really strong intuition for when everybody else is ready, when their utility is ready to be coordinated to make a, a group push, for example. Sometimes you have to judge things like the utility usage on an individual play so you not only have you got the mix of those two categories of games but you don't always have all the information of both like facets of it um the other thing i want to talk about is prioritizing action uh this is something that a lot of people do complain about every now and then um about you know casters missed this point and and whatever so prioritizing action is quite a difficult thing and i have a number of bullet points written down about this uh the first one is what i mentioned previously about picking one point to discuss again this is one of those things that young casters and by young i mean new casters tend to uh do wrong quite a bit at first and you've sort of got to get out the habit i know i certainly was the same and i imagine most people were and that is when you try to talk about too much too many things that happened and really the cast ends up just sounding like a mess in a lot of cases it sounds very rushed you don't get much depth uh, in in any of the um points that you're making and it just doesn't sound particularly structured the other thing is it is not conducive to building a solid story of the game which is one of the overarching objectives of the cast in the first place so when you're picking just one point to discuss what that involves is absorbing all of the information that you are seeing throughout the course of the game and then filtering it in real time so that you can pick which part it is that you want to prioritize that's quite difficult to do the other thing is as a color caster you have to be following the story that the play-by-play -play is telling if the play-by-play -play is focusing on a certain story that is you know unfolding within the action and you start talking about something completely unrelated regardless of how cool or minute it was in the round, it's gonna sound disjointed and to be honest, quite stupid. So even if something really cool happened, it's not necessarily the correct thing to talk about. The other thing is it's very hard to follow everything while it's happening and while you've got all these other things to consider and the likelihood is viewers will always catch something that you missed and that's kind of just the way it is um just as sometimes you're watching a cast and the caster will mention something that you missed i've had that before it happens watching as a viewer and watching as a caster are two very different experiences the other thing with prioritizing action is it's not just about the story that the play-by-play -play play is telling in the moment and in the round but also the story focus that you you've decided to have before the game that you are having overarching the game that holistic story that you're telling and in a lot of case that will involve specific players and that will be based on their past performances in previous games something particularly interesting about them players that you want to be following throughout the course of the game will often influence your prioritization of action and analysis as well um, a really good example i suppose at the moment will be in a lot of the ssg games the story of luke is kind of being told um also noticed uh how the story of thinking nade was really being told in the the more recent ssg games as well and how he's been doing great on flank watch and things like that and i can remember this because this is specific stuff that the casters have put in effort to ensure that story carries forward if they had not had that and it all just been like a kind of equalized mess of focusing on everybody i probably wouldn't take much away from that game so it's the fact that i remember that is a testament to how well the cast to set that up. Another reason will be relating to past games, which kind of comes under that story umbrella, but contextualizing playstyles, which is also really important. One of the things that casters, I think particularly color casters, will focus on is how a playstyle evolves of a certain team. It helps you set expectations for how a team will play and make analysis on the plays that they do do, but it also just helps you know play out that story of either a, a team's improvement or their worsening or comparing them to their past achievements for example play styles in my opinion are really interesting and being able to contextualize them and build on to what we know about a play style again involves prioritizing what action you're seeing on screen and how it fits into the play style and if that is more of a priority to talk about than some random thing that doesn't necessarily play on that story and the other thing is knowing your time limits and foregoing points that would violate them and again in siege part of the reason this is so difficult comes back to what i was saying about it fitting into both of those categories where you don't really have a formula for when each caster should be talking because it can change so rapidly round by 
fly around. So trying to make an assessment for how much time you have to talk about something is really going to affect what you talk about and how you talk about it as well. And whether it's more worth your time to talk about a story point or maybe inject some humor or be a bit more lighthearted. Those are all decisions you have to make on the fly. You have to make them in conjunction with your co-caster while not directly verbalizing that with them and that comes back to the synergy thing as well you know these are decisions you have to make as a duo without actually discussing them and they have to be in real time as well so the time limit thing is is really important and that's why when it comes down to picking one point to talk about you have to decide what that's going to be oftentimes focused on that as well and there have been tons of cases and i'm sure every caster under the sun could tell you this where there's been something really interesting that's happened and you just haven't been able to go into depth about it because the time and the action unfolding has not permitted it and it could be really frustrating but that's what the analyst desk is there for at the end anyway is to pick up on those things that you couldn't necessarily bring out in the cast so listen to your analyst desk there are other things like humor um you know that's oftentimes really personal down to the casting duo itself uh, inflection and enunciation um this is a big issue for some casters where they'll know what they're talking about but they'll still talk at the end of the sentences like this and they'll be like inflecting at the end and it's not very nice to listen to uh that's a, a big problem for people who don't have a ton of public speaking experience or don't really know how to address a camera um but the actual enunciation that casters make their clarity also really important talking speed Another issue that new casters have is often talking really fast because in your head, it doesn't sound like you're talking really fast. I remember I studied a caster called Wolf who is, uh, he's now on the LCK, but he was on Overwatch League for a while um, it, for really clear and well-paced color casting. I remember studying him for ages because I used to have a problem where I spoke way too quickly um, back in my early days of casting. Um, but that is one of those things that you require a lot of VOD review for because it's really hard to judge how whilst you're talking when you're doing it you really have to watch yourself back um but yeah i'm not going to go into detail about a ton of those last couple of points and there are more to that as well but i think i've covered most of the important stuff that you kind of need to understand about the technicalities of casting and where a lot of the difficulties can arise and where a lot of the skill that you don't necessarily acknowledge and see when watching a cast comes in at the end of the day you'll always be welcome to like or dislike any caster for any reason that's entirely your preference we we're the same, you know, even though we're casters, like we'll still have people that we prefer to listen to and prefer not to listen to. That's just how it is. Um, one thing that I will say just at the end is please, if you're complimenting a caster, do not bring down another caster in the process. We're all friends. And even if we're secretly enemies, uh, we're not going to let that on. <laughs> and um, and it also makes us look bad to kind of accept compliments like that when they're shutting down friends of ours uh, in the process. So no one's going to appreciate that. If you're going to criticize a caster, please do it constructively because casters do want to learn and they do want to be as good as they can. But uh, maybe don't try and talk from a place of not understanding because immediately a caster is more likely to throw away and disregard your feedback if they think that you have completely misunderstood the role that they're doing. But other than that, I really hope this helped and I hope it was interesting. Um, this should really apply to any game, but obviously it was a siege focus. Uh, anyway, it turned out that I was talking for half an hour and I've got an hour until I've got to be uh, on broadcast. So. I'll see you guys in the next video. I hope this helps and uh, I'm interested in the discussion that's going to arise from this, but I'll catch you.